I'm reading off of the New King James Version. Acts 5, verse 38 and 39. I'm going to read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the people of God say, Amen. 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 And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan, for if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you can't overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. So the title of this sermon today is What is of God Will Stand? Amen. What is of God Will Stand? Father, in the name of Jesus, I place myself in your hands, Lord. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to reign over this entire program service, Lord, from beginning to end. I ask that you would help me in the delivery of the words that you have imparted into my life. I thank you that they come from heaven, Lord. I thank you for this rhema word, Lord. I thank you that you're in control. I thank you, Father God, that you're the one establishing. I thank you that you're bringing things to order. I thank you that you're speaking to your church. And Father, I just ask that the Spirit of the Lord would anoint our ears today so that we would not harden our hearts, but that we would humbly receive your engrafted word and allow it to do its work in us, Lord, so that we may be placed in order, in alignment, Lord, to heaven to your perfect will father god that we may be purified father god from every unclean thing father god from everything lord that defiles us inwardly lord that your word will come and purge it out in the name of jesus we need your word lord so father we thank you for your precious word in the name of jesus i give you glory amen 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 what is of god will stand what is of god will stand uh, keep your Bibles open because I'm going to be uh, shooting back and forth, giving you uh, going. We're going to look at it this through scripture. And so if I sound like I'm teaching, then I'm teaching. If I sound like I'm preaching, then I'm preaching. OK, uh, I don't know when I, I gauge go into one or the other. Uh, sometimes I'm like, oh, I was pre I was preaching too much. And they're like, oh, it sounded like teaching or vice versa. So I just hope that your life would be blessed today. Uh, I just pray that your life will be blessed. This message uh, when I got notified on Wednesday um, that I would have to take over. I began to really dig in deep because you have to understand that to get a word from God, sometimes you're going to have to push into prayer. Sometimes you're going to have to push into fasting. You're going to have to knock. You're going to have to ask. You're going to have to seek in order to receive something from God. And I was getting a little bit desperate because by Friday there was still nothing. And I'm just up, laid up on the floor, crying before the presence of God. Because I said, Lord, your people need something. And I am unprepared. I don't know what, you know. So I remember sat by, uh, Saturday morning, I took time here to just be away with the Lord. And the Lord brought me to this word. And, you know, it's one of those words where the words come out of the page and they slap you. Amen. So I said, I know that's the word right there. <laughs> that's the word. It don't wake me up, right? So I want to I wanna, I wanna set up kind of like a framework right now. Uh, in my introduction, I want to set up the framework from which I'm going to give you three points. I'm going to launch out three points. The first point that I'm going to share with you is what God has ordained and chosen you to do, it shall be done. What God has ordained and chosen you to do, it shall be done. We're going to look at a second point. You cannot overthrow what is of God. You cannot. You cannot overthrow what is of God. And number three, a man is foolish to fight against God. He surely is foolish. A man is foolish. And when I say man, I'm using it for uh, meaning both men and women. If you want to sit there and fight with God, you a fool. You're just a darn fool. Fight, trying to fight with the God Almighty, the creator of the universe, the omnipotent, omniscient God, the God who is a spirit, the God who transcends time, the God who was there before you were even in his mind. Oh my goodness. But you think that you can fight with God. So we're, let's, let's just give me some time to expand a little bit here. And so in order to understand verse 38 and 39, I always tell you folks, we got to look at it contextually. You got to go and you got to read what's been going on, what's been happening. And I, I got to tell you that uh, I think Acts is one of the best books 
to read because it is not only the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is the birth of the church, but it is the church in action. The church that is moving in faith, the church that is moving in the power of Holy Spirit, the church who is a missionary church. This is a church where it's beginnings. So you get to draw from their examples. You get to draw from what they went through, their experiences, and then you get to glean from that wisdom and say, okay, I need to be aware. Okay, I know that this is more. Okay, I know. And so we glean from the word of God this wisdom that we can then apply to our daily lives. Amen? So um, if we look at verse 12, uh, my Bible uh, has little themes. And mine uh, says verse 12 through verse 16. Uh, it has the theme of continuing power in the church. So remember that in chapter 2, we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of what um, Luke uh, was talking about, uh, referring to Jesus' words, is that you shall be endued with power. And when the Holy Spirit of God comes, you shall receive what? Power, dunamis. That power is not so you can sit there and look pretty. That power is not so you can come and just come in uh, Sunday, come back uh, Wednesday, come back uh, um, Monday, and, and, and you don't do any, there's a purpose for why we have been endued with power. There is a purpose. And so we see that the church has been given dynamos. It's been given dinamita. It's been given power to do something, right? And so uh, we find here that we, 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 we down the timeline, timeline of this chapter in chapter five, we see that, that the power continue. It was maintained. It wasn't one of those little uh, goosebump experiences where you come and, oh, I feel the Lord. And I talk in tongues and I jump up and down and I cry and my mocos come out. And then I go back to the world and then I forgot about this experience and I live a life that is so uh, an the antithesis of what God had already uh, wanted for me. No, to, 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 to receive the power, but to maintain it on a daily basis to maintain it. We've been talking about prayer here. We've been talking about open portals here. We've been talking about how we can walk with in the supernatural because that is where God has positioned us to be. But it amazes me how folks, how Christian who have power, who have God, one day live lives victoriously, but then two or three days are already in defeat, already in failure, already in negativity and pessimism. I'm like, what's going on? It can't be but this is a church that maintained the power. So by the fifth chapter, they were still going strong. They were still, you know, you got to add to the fire people of God. Let me tell you what, we, um, Dan and I went walking because we saw all you people that are like either running or walking and like Fonny's like number one already, Adam's number two, I'm like what is going on here? That floor changes daily. And it's like, you know, and, and by the time I'm done walking, I'm like, you know, cause I'm like, my goodness, I can't catch up with these folks but you maintain, you're walking, you're being active, you're moving. I'm like, wow. And that's what the church was doing, moving, moving. They were just moving out in faith. They was, they was, they was just in the power of God. And, and you know, again, let me just say, we were walking down at night and we saw a family. They were having this little um, fire pit outside. They even had the, I guess, the, um, the screen uh, on, the, on, the, on the wall of the house. And the kids were watching Trolls. You know, I mean, it was like, I'm like, well, it's cold to be outside. But, but, but as, as we were walking and observing, I saw the fire pit. And you know what? The fire pit, in order for it to have a nice, big, strong fire, you've got to keep adding wood to it. In order for your life to maintain the fire of God, what are you adding to it? You've got to be adding word. You've got to be taking your quarterly time to get into prayer. You've got to be in congregation with like-minded believers. That fire, your responsibility as a priest is to keep that fire going. And so we find that the apostles were keeping that fire maintained. So it says, uh, through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. I'm reading in verse 12. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. So verse 12 is telling us there's been an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's empowering the believers to minister with signs and wonders. It wasn't just to, oh, whew, such a beautiful experience for myself. No. What I have been imparted into, guess what? I'm going to go out and impart it to others. What God gives you is not just for you. And we got too many fat Christians sitting in church with God's glory, and they ain't doing anything. And I'm talking about spiritually, not physically. I'm talking spiritually. We eat. We nourish. We get the blessing. We get the glory. We get the gifting. We get the impartation. We get this mentor. I mean, we get, we get, we get. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with what God has given to you? 
You're filling up, you're filling up, but you can't get any more until you start imparting what you've been receiving. So we've got to make sure that what we're getting is not just for us, that we're not selfish and we give it to others. And we see that here, they were not just ministering. They were moving with signs and wonders or, 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 or to, to say, by, by the seed, to say that the apostles were backed up by God's presence, backed up by, by the power of manifestation of Holy Spirit in their lives for signs and wonders. And the, the, the Lord hasn't changed He's still the same. He's still looking for people who will move in faith Amen. that he could back up with signs and wonders. Amen. Gives us examples. The sick were healed. The infirmed that were tormented by unclean spirits were delivered. The lame and the paralyzed were able to get healed and they were walking. So the church was growing and progressing in oneness of mind and spirit according to what the, uh, Luke is telling us in verse 12. The church was growing. It was progressing in oneness of mind and spirit. And when the spirit of the Lord is truly moving in a body, it's truly moving in a church that is seeking God. Like today, I'm looking for volunteers last night. I need people that will fast, that will pray. We need to come together because the battle is real. I don't know about you. You heard Pastor Dan talk about at the beginning. And I, I you know what? I'm going to stop the enemy on his head in the name of Jesus and rebuke him out because I'm not going to give him any kind of platform so we can just talk about everything that he's doing. No, you know what, devil, you're defeated because all that tells me is that there's glory approaching. All that's telling me is that there's growth approaching. All that's telling me is that God is about to unleash something in the natural that's already has been established for the church in the spiritual. Come on, people of God. Oh, glory a Dios, hallelujah. If you can't worship, I just worship him on myself then. Hallelujah. And we see that, that this was causing an awakening in the neighborhood, an awakening in the community. What's going on over there? You know, Noelle talked about how she was in the highway and she's like, oh my God, you know, and all, why is there no cars? Is this the walking dead? No. <laughs> she's in the dr driving because there's no track, but then all of a sudden she starts seeing and I'm sure that all the passersby were going slow. There's a, there's a name they give those passersby that go real slow. The Gators Watcher, watch something, Gators, Gators uh, Traffic or something like that, that they go real slow to watch. And that's what happens when God begins to move in a body, when God begins to do great exploits, when the body begins to waken up and take its position. Come on now, we all have a heavenly position. We have been sitting in heavenly places. We're not just thrown down on the floor. Maybe the devil tells you that. And maybe you believe those lies that I'm nothing, that I'm worth nothing, that I'm nobody, that I've always been rejected. The people have left me. My best friends have left me. Oh, I'm not loved. Oh, well, maybe, maybe that's where you're at. But let me tell you what, the Bible tells me a different thing. The Bible tells me that Jesus Jesus Christ, who died on the cross of Calvary, he cleansed me, he purified me, he justified me, and then, not only that, he set me in heavenly places. And I didn't even have to pay for any of that. It was, it was part of my spiritual inheritance. So we are all given the opportunity to sit in heavenly places, and it is from that position that we must be effective and work for the kingdom of God. And let me tell you what, that when we're working and we're growing, just as this body has been doing, that's why we're being assaulted. That's why you are not in the in-between place just because God just doesn't, he wants to be mean to you or, you know, the devil wants to tell you that, you know, you, you didn't do things right, so you end up in the in-between place. No, 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 no. God is perfect in all he does. God is perfect in what he does. And he allows us, he allows the enemy, yes, access to do what he has to do. Look at the life of Job. He, he allows us to go through situations and seasons because he's trying to get glory out of us. What he's already deposited in us, there's too much dross. There's too much carnality. There's too much sensuality. There's too much of us still. So he's got to allow us sometimes in these places to be aware of the presence of God. Last night as we were walking back, Dan said something. He says, I think that that's Mars. We're walking and, and he goes, I, I, I believe that that star is Mars. So we start talking about um, space. And one question that I asked him is, well, the speed, how is it that we in this atmosphere are able to stay? You know, we're not floating. I don't see anybody floating around here. Okay, we can, we can walk on the earth, right, Isaac? We can breathe. 
you know, we got oxygen, but then when we go into space, space is a vacuum. Space is like, is, does it have, I asked him, I said, does it have its own atmosphere? Does it, you know, and so we started talking about physics and we started talking about the mass of each planet. And when items get close to proximity, when you were in, pro when that item is in proximity to a planet, the planet's gravitational force will pull because the thing is that the item is very small and the planet is very big. So it'll bring it. Well, let me tell you what, God is all powerful and he is the greatest mass that we will ever encounter. And as we get close proximity to him, what he's going to do is his presence will draw us into him. His presence will come and bring us into him. And so we just need to try Try to get in proximity to them. Helen Keller once said, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. There is power in unity. Amen. The devil is afraid of a church that comes to be a church that is united in one mind, in one spirit, with a goal to do what God has established her to do. He's afraid of it. Why? Because it's a powerful church. Amen. We cannot be ignorant to the fact that when the church is moving forward in power and manifestation of Holy Spirit is being seen, you get into church, you're experiencing glory, you're like, what a presence, what, man, what a teaching, man, what a service, man, this is just, and you're like, who, what is this? This is just like, and you're feeling, you know, you're feeling good. You're like, whoa, you know, and everybody's like coming together. And like, yeah, let's praise, let's worship, let's this and let's that. Well, guess what? The enemy is not going to be happy. You have to know that enemy is not going to be happy. So look at verse 17. What happens when the church is growing in power, growing in notoriety, growing because of the signs and wonders? The people are drawing now close to the apostles because they are like, I want to know what's happening. What's, what's going on? How is this possible that, that, that I remember that demon possessed person and all of a sudden they're delivered and they're healed? Wait, wait, wait. That, that guy used to sit pedaling and he used to beg. He was a beggar. He couldn't walk, but now he's healed and now he's actually having a job. What, what is it? And so, you know, and you know, uh, a lot of people like to chatter. Sometimes they chatter things they shouldn't. But when something big is happening, that word by mouth is like, I think it runs, it runs fast. Let me just put it that way. So the high priest rose up, all those who were with him. Pharisees got together with the Sadducees. Check this out. Don't miss in between lines. The high priest rose up, high priest of that council, Sanhedrin council, that is. They were the ones that established the law. And the usual ones that were with them were the Pharisees. But this time, they decided to join forces with the Sadducees. Now, isn't that interesting? I heard a message last week, or I think the week before, and Dr. Matthew Stevenson says, you know what, when folks want to come against you, the, uh, the people that used to hate each other, they're going to love each other, going to be best friends just to come and oppose you. And so we see here that the Sadducees and the Pharisees got together to come up against who? Against the apostles, the servants of God. And the Bible says that they were filled with indignation. The Bible says it right there in verse 17 in my Bible. I don't know what your Bible says. And so you will always find, you will always find those of the religious sect who will unite, even if they're enemies, they will come together to oppose you and God's movement in your life. Do you understand this? Because that's what Acts is teaching us. That's what Acts is showing us, is that when the Lord begins to manifest his glory in your life and he raises you up in glory, Holy Spirit starts using you, whether it's in preaching and teaching, whether it's in musician, whether it's in mime, whether it's with children's ministry, whether it's bus ministry, whether it's whatever that the Lord begins to use you in, I'm going to tell you what, there will always be a religious spirit that rises up to come up against you to oppose what God is doing in your life. So uh, when it says that they were filled with indignation, indignation is, is, yeah, anger, but it's speaking more here about jealousy. <laughs> jealousy. Let me tell you what. And wherever you find jealousy, guess who's, what, guess what sister's around? Green with? Envy's there. Wherever there's jealousy, you're going to find envy. And so this religious spirit filled with jealousy and envy put the apostles in what? In a prison. They put the apostles, they grabbed their hands on them, threw them in the prison. 
for preaching the word of God in the power of Holy Spirit. Okay? So there was at that time no law about religious freedoms like we do today. Well, I got my right. Well, what about my religious freedoms? I can speak, you know, I can talk, I can preach, I can, you know, but we're getting to a time where now Christianity is being persecuted, where the churches are, are, are going to find themselves in a place where uh, their sermons are going to be censored. Because now when we, today, in this era, when we preach the word, and I have to preach according to what God speaks, especially when I hit those tough topics on homosexuality, on fornication, on sleeping, you know, you can do friends with benefits. And, and I have to come and speak as a pastor, the word of God. Guess what they throw at you? Hate speech. You're a, you're, you're a hater. Hate speech. That's, the, that's, that's, that's what we're going to have to contend with. I remember a few years back uh, before the administration changed, uh, the churches were literally uh, starting to feel the pressure where sermons had to be given um, because governors were starting to, especially the one in Arizona, has said if a preacher um, needs to send the sermon so I can look at it to make sure that there's no hate speech in it. And when the administration, the new administration came in, that executive order was tossed out. Uh, you want to call it filibustered, whatever it was. And so um, we were at least at, as a church and as pastors, we were free from that. But guess what? We're coming into those days. We're coming back to those days where we are going to be pushed. You're going to have a lot of pushback. You're going to have a lot of opposition because of if God puts you to preach the word of God, teach the word of God, and you teach it according to how God wants you to, you're going to have some pushback. So uh, whenever you move in the prophetic, uh, the devil will use this type of spirit to rise up against you and will try to imprison you. He's going to try to imprison you, a religious spirit that comes with the motive of jealousy and envy to shut you down, to imprison you. And I'm not telling you this so you can be intimidated. No, I'm telling you this so you can be informed, aware of the things that the enemy brings to our doorstep. But we know we got the power of God. We know we got Jesus on our side. We got the blood of Jesus and we got our creator of the universe who, you know what, defends us. Amen. And so jealousy is like a cancer. It eats the believer from the inside. Well, how? Well, because it robs him or her of God's given promises in their life. How does that happen? Well, jealous people, what they do is they'll follow you to see what is happening in your life. Mm -hmm. They go and they scrutinize, even though you don't know it, they're going to go, uh, if you have a social media open, they're going to go and see what's going on in Facebook. They're going to go see an Instagram. They, I mean, they're following you. It's interesting because this morning I saw, I said, Lord, this isn't a coincidence, Lord. Only you do stuff like this. You allow me to see. As I'm upstairs writing these final notes, a car passes by. And I said, look at, look at here. They're scouting us out. Mm -hmm. Yep, a family that went by and I know them. And they went by right in front of our house. And I said, Lord, are, are they trying to see what's going on over here? Jealous people. Instead of focusing on what should be happening in their life, what is God calling me to do? What is it that I have to do? No, I'm too busy checking out what's happening over there with Grisel. <laughs> you got, I'm sorry, but I got to give God glory because if people have to even drive by my house to see what's happening, I'm just like, Lord, you're doing some great stuff. You're doing great stuff. So the enemy knows, okay? Amen, amen, everybody all right? Hallelujah. So the enemy knows full well how dangerous we the church can be to his kingdom when we walk as children of God and grow in maturity. So growing believers... It's not only about quantity. Some churches focus on, we gotta hurry up, we gotta hurry up 60, 70, 80, 90, pack them up, pack them up, pack them like sardines. We've gotta have a big church because that means that God is here. No, I'm not worried about quantity. What I am worried about is quality, quality. So Lord, you wanna grow, your Bible, your word says that you added on to the church. That's fine, you wanna continue growing the church, that's on you because that's your people. But one thing I do want you to do is grow the people in quality, mature them in the things of God, in the knowledge of God. And so growing believers is very scary to the devil. You growing, you maturing, you moving in the giftings, you moving in faith, you understanding your identity, you doing what God's calling you to do, that puts the devil at notice and they're afraid. So what better way then, so to counteract that, 
to counteract us from growing and maturing, expanding, what better way that the devil will carefully craft a way to subvert us, to keep us from that understanding, so he uses a specific way through deception from that spirit of jealousy and envy. So the apostles, because of that, what? Were placed in prison because of that religious spirit that was coming from jealousy and envy. What? In leadership. You better believe it. You better believe it. When you have immature leadership, you will have jealousy. It might be dormant. It might be quiet for the time being. But let you, God, start rising you up. Let God start elevating you, promoting you. All of a sudden, that dormancy in your little friend, in your family member, or even in leadership, all of a sudden, that thing starts rising up. It shows its ugly head when God starts to promote you. I'm telling you this because God is telling you guys as a church, prepare, prepare, because there's quite a few of you that God is bringing to promote you, that God is bringing you guys to elevate you, that God is gonna use as a powerful instrument with power, with signs and wonders. You need to pay attention to this so that you don't run away, that you don't stop and say, oh my God, and, and, and fall into the prison of what are they saying and the comments and the judgments and the critic. So what? The only opinion that matters is God's opinion. Lord, help me with this. So the apostles were placed in prison because of the religious, jealous, and envious spirit the leaders had. So understand and always expect people to rise up and most often time in the house with Christians. Yep, with your Christian mom, with your Christian dad, with your Christian cousins, with your Christian friends. Unfortunately, so expect this. Who will ridicule you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They'll criticize you, mm -hmm. comment or judge what God is doing in your life. These folks, they, 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 are, they, they sit dormant or idle. But, but the minute that God begins to lift you up and use you for his glory, trouble ensues. These, let me tell you what, these are the type of people that they don't do nothing for the kingdom of God, but the minute God uses you, they have everything to say against. So they don't do anything, but they don't want nobody else doing anything for the kingdom of God. Proverbs chapter 16 says, idle hands are the devil's playground. You better be a church that works. Come on, people of God. We've got to make sure we're working in something. You know, we're going to have an opportunity to serve this weekend. We've got a lot of positions that have to be filled, not only here in the platform of the front of, of worship and singing and instruments, but we've got other things, uh, uh, video technology, translation, uh, guest servicing. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of things, and we need hands on board. We need people, the church of God, to come and be willing to say, I'm here. I'm willing to work. Put me wherever you want, even if it's clean the toilets. Let me clean the toilet. So God said that what the devil means for evil, he turns it for our good. Whatever the devil means for evil, he twists it around and turns it for our good. Isaiah 54 says, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And every tongue which rises up against us. Come on now. This is the word of God, which rises up against us. That's letting us know there will be a word that rises up against us. There will be some words that might be negative, that might be criticism, that might be judgment. But I don't give a care because look what the word of God says. Rises up against us uh, in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is from me, says the Lord. So when the apostles were put in prison, God sends his angel. Jesus, come on, people. God, God sends his angel. You see, that's why I'd rather be on God's side. We're in the days where you better make a choice who you're going to serve. Joshua says, as for me and my house, we serve in the Lord. I don't know about you. You want to go off to your forefathers? God, you go ahead. But as for me, I know where I'm going to stand. Moses had to give that same ultimatum. We see still today, Eli, Elias, um, Elias, Elijah had to give that same uh, uh, verbatim to the people of Israel. Come on, come over here. I'm going to show you something. But y'all need to make up your mind. You, you, you just dabbling with the world and then dabbling with God. And you come and be a Christian a couple of days, then you go back out to the world and you act like, 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 like some, uh, the Bible calls it whoring. Uh, when you go off after other gods, you become a harlot. You become, you go off after. And so you want to come back and you have this, this little casual relationship with God, but you want to have your feet in two worlds. You've got to choose one God. And when you make that choice, if you chose God, let me tell you what, 
This is what the stuff that we're going to, as I keep expounding the sermon, you're going to hear what God will do for you too. He says, he says when, when the apostles were put in prison, God sends his angel. And, and on the power and protection we have at our disposal, I say, oh, the, the, the power, I put power and protection we have at our disposal. As believers, as children of God, we have at our disposal the heavenly host of angels, the garrisons of heaven that could come and help us out. We're not alone. We're not alone. So God sends his angels to deliver us from the uh, snare of the fowler, according to uh, Psalm 91. He comes and sends his angels to keep watch, to help us so that we're not falling in the snares of the enemy. So even when the, when the religious spirit wants to rise up, when the folks want to rise up against what God is doing in your life, what God is calling in your life, what God is moving you to do, don't get distracted. Don't get dis- Tell your neighbor, don't get distracted. You know, tell your neighbor, don't pay attention to them. Don't pay attention to them. Don't pay attention. The devil wants, he'll bait you and wants you to grab the lies and internalize their words. So then you're hurt, offended, and then you're limited in your ability to walk and and be effective for the kingdom of God. So we can't pay attention to them. So the apostles, again, were provided a literal divine agent from heaven to release them from prison. God can send us literal angels. And sometimes his angels come disguised as servants of God. Men and women connected to heaven that God sends to you to deliver you from your prisons. Thank you for the amen. Do you understand that? God has been doing such a greater work and you're oblivious to it. That you're here today and death didn't take you because there's been angels surrounding you, protecting you, and you're here today with life. We heard Noelle's testimony, thank God, because we're praying and we know that the angels are hedging her. 91, you know, those that are refuged in the presence of God under the wings of the Almighty, what? No harm can come to them. A thousand and ten thousand can come at my side, but none shall befall me. Why? Because of the protection of angels. Let me tell you what, when Dan and I were in missions and we went over to Guatemala, there was a point in time. I didn't get to see it. He got to have that experience. But we were deep in the mountain. We were like 1130 at night, deep in the mountain with no lights. We don't have like these lights out here in the street. I mean, you're in the literal cusp of a mountain and it's pitch black. The only thing you see are the lights in the front of your car. And I remember we were lost and we began to pray and ask the Lord, uh, Lord, we need an intervention. We know the enemy's opposing us. And that man back there started shouting in the car, did you see that? And I'm driving and I'm like, what you, what you, it's dark, what you seen? And, and he's like, there, there it is again. There. And I was like, what are you seeing? And that man could literally see in all darkness that we were, he was seeing some demonic stuff. He was, we were both sensing oppression. But let me tell you what, the angel of the Lord, Amen. God sends the angel of the Lord Amen. that came from heaven and descended in that light. And my husband was able to see the tips of the wings of the fluttering of that angel. And we were at peace. We made it out of that confusion where we were at, made it safely to our destination because God provides his angels for us. I remember I went to Dominican Republic the first time to do missions and I got ministered to. And I remember that the young man that God used to begin to bring a prophetic word to my life, that man did not know me and I did not know him. And he started bringing things from my childhood. And one of the things he says is, I, the angel of the Lord has always been at your side, even though that you have felt very lonely. And you're here today because the angel continues to be at your side. I said, Lord, I, well, if you gave me an angel, I'm like, Senor, I want to see it then. Open my eyes. I want to see my angel. I want to see the one that's that, you know, and that's been, that's, the, I've had different confirmations about how God has provided his angels. Amen. And so the apostles, they saw, they heard, they, and they followed the instructions of this angel. Uh, I looked at the verse in the Passion Translation, and it states that the angel had appeared before them. He supernaturally, this is a supernatural activity. This is stuff that like is gonna wig you out. This is stuff like is mission impossible, okay? Like you're gonna be like, well, how did that happen? That's because the angel of the Lord is leading the way and just listen and just co- listen to the commands, obey the commands and he's gonna get you out of places that the enemy has tried to keep you in. Come on now, can somebody say amen? 
the apostles were spiritually perceptive to know that God had sent his angel. They obeyed to every command, ended up on the outside. So the question is, are we perceptive enough to discern when God brings to us his angels? Do we listen? Do we obey the instructions? Or do we choose to remain in our own prisons? Just a question. Verse 21, apostles went to the temple to continue the work that they had begun. The angel gave them the command, go, go back and go keep preaching, keep teaching. I love it when the Lord has to give me a godly phone call and brings an angel of the Lord to talk to me and tell me, I have put the word in your mouth. You are the trumpet. I have given you as a prophet, speak, speak and teach. Don't stop. Don't change the word. Don't. I mean, already various, I was like, okay, Lord. Go back to the task, even though when I want to run away, even though when I'm like, no, Lord, I don't want, no, nope, let's move in faith. This is not about what I want. This is not how I feel. This is about being obedient to God. God desires from us obedience. We be tackling uh, point A, point B, point C, and then come to the Lord and says, well, I did A, B, and C. And the Lord says, I didn't ask you to do all that. I asked you to obey one simple command and you haven't done it. Can we be faithful with our one God-given assignment? The apostles were, they went to the temple, they continue the work that they had begun. You cannot allow interruptions to halt the work of God. My God, people of God, we gotta be zealous for the Lord. We've gotta have that passion to protect what God has given to us, that no matter what, no matter what we're going through, that no matter what is going on in my circumstances, that I am going to maintain, persevere what God has given to me to do. You can't allow people, trials, maltreatment, the voices of the naysayers to stop you from sharing the gospel. So what happened between verse 22 and 32 is there was such a commotion with the high priest and the councilman because uh, when they called and they said to the, to the guardian, the, the police officer or the one who watches the prisons, hey, go get so-and-so. And they're like, oh, they're not there. They're not there. Well, where are they? Somebody comes in. Hey, those two buddies or those three buddies that you're looking for, they're back out there in the temple. They're still preaching. They're out there preaching. So you imagine a spirit that's trying to control you, a spirit that's trying to shut you down. The Lord brings an angel and supernaturally delivers you and puts you back to square number one. Imagine how irate. Imagine how, how, how infuriated the high priest and the councilmen were because the men were preaching again. So they bring the apostles and they're before the courts. They bring them. And so the high priest begins to tell them, I told you to shut up. And I'm just paraphrasing. I told you to shut up. I told you not to preach Jesus anymore. I told you not to teach. I told you not to do that anymore. What did uh, Peter say? Peter, I love Peter. Peter came out and says, well, guess what? We obey God rather than man. Because when man tries to block what God has called you to do. That's where you have to say, look, uh, buddy, with all due respect, I got to do what God's called me to do and you can't hold me back. That's the only time that we then ignore submitting to authorities when they, oh, they're trying to overrule God when God says, no, this is what I'm establishing. So they were brought to court. Peter says, I ought to obey God rather than man. So it, what did it do? It evoked anger in the high priest and they plotted to kill them. What I want you guys to understand is that persecution has always threatened the church since the beginning. That's always been. But guess what? We need not to fear for its survival. Tortullian once said, addressing the rulers of the Roman Empire, he said, kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to dust. The more you mow us down, the more we grow. <laughs> Isn't that what the Lord was doing with the people of Israel in Egypt? When the, the king was uh, putting more work on them, they were populating more, they were growing more. Isn't that what happened with the church of Acts? That the more persecution, the more scattered, and the more the gospel was shared all over the place? So we see verses 33 and 39 that then one stood up from the council. His name was Gamaliel. And I'll talk to you about him in a little bit. But point number one, what God has ordained and chosen to you to do, it shall be done. What God has ordained and chosen you to do, it shall be done. P 
People are foolish if they think they can stop what God has ordained on your life. We say, I thank God that it is God speaking in my life and not man. Man has had his time and he said, and he continues to say things about my life. But you know what? I go to the rock. I go to Jesus Christ. I go to my creator who has ordained me, who has given me a word and I rely on his word only. That's the only voice that that's the only ear I put attention to is what God is saying. When we're talking about ordaining, we're talking about to a point to a position of authority. So God is positioning and he's sitting his ordained men and women into greater realms of spiritual authority. And it is there that we, each of us will stand. We will stand there. But, but, but listen, we cannot be ignorant of what God is doing, but don't be ignorant of what the enemy is also doing because he too is also putting in his appointed ones who appear well-groomed, highly educated, and polished by the academic, the worldly academic standards. And quite often they're very religious as the high priest was. And some of Satan's appointed ones can quote scripture. I mean, they're walking Bibles. They can tell you where to find the chapter and the verse much quicker than possibly any of us. But what happens is that they stand powerless before the ordained of God. Apostle Paul once said, my speech and preaching was not by enticing words of man's wisdom. It was in a demonstration of the spirit of God, spirit of power. So the ordained of God walks in demonstration of Holy Spirit. This church here walks in the power of Holy Spirit. Every man, every woman of this body, we walk in the power of Holy Spirit. John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You did not choose me. I chose you. Every believer is to be fruitful, productive, active worker in God's kingdom. Bearing fruit is God's calling and purpose for our life according to the words of Jesus in this book of John. God does not have a backup plan. I'm going to tell you what. If you thought that maybe God might have a backup plan, he doesn't. God does not have a backup plan for reaching the world. He has entrusted this task to each and every one of us. We must be sharing the good news and helping others come to the faith. No matter what spiritual gift and abilities you have, they are meant to produce fruit. So how are you doing in the area of fruit bearing for God's kingdom? How are you using your God appointed position to grow and increase the kingdom of God? Peter and the apostles took serious to this. They took serious to their ordained position. They preached Jesus. When was the last time you evangelized to someone? When was the last time you invited someone to come to church with you? But you were active in that you don't only put the invite, but you begin to pray and intercede so that their hearts would be soft and tender so they would come with you the day of service. So it's not just giving the invite, but then it's praying so that the Holy Spirit has access to tenderize that heart. When was the last time that you prayed over someone who was sick or bound and they were healed and delivered? Again, that point, I'm going to reiterate what God has ordained and chosen you to do, it shall be done. I'm gonna give you one final example. Go to the book of Jeremiah, go to chapter one. I love Jeremiah because the Lord has ministered to me um, a multiple, multiple, multiple times through Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And I wanna share with you something with Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter one, you guys can read at home verse four through 10, but if we look, uh, God's calling and anointing on Jeremiah's life as a prophet began not because someone said it in his face. It began in the womb. It began in the womb. When we look at Psalms chapter 139, it talks about that David says, you have known me in the inward parts. <laughs> you, you knitted me in that secret place, that hidden dark place. That's where God's ordained for you and me have come from, the womb. God reveals to Jeremiah 
before I formed you in the womb. I knew you. Verse 5, if you look at verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctify you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So when he's talking about sanctification, I set you apart with purpose. And that's why the devil tries to kill many at the womb level. That's why this thing with abortion, we as a, <clears throat> as a Christian, as a body of Christ, we cannot agree. We can't come in agreement with the laws that, that kill uh, tons of billions of babies in the womb. Because that's the enemy coming against what God has already ordained from the womb. He's not even letting them to be born. So that's a threat to the kingdom of God. So as men and women of God, when we vote, let us look. Don't look at the blue or the red. Don't look at political parties. We need to have the word of God and see who stands for what. Who stands for uh, life? Who stands for righteousness? Who stands for truth? Who stands for religious liberty? No, we need to look at what the Bible says, and then from the Bible we vote. We don't vote versus by what we're hearing, by uh, numbers, by, we don't know. We've got to defend God's word because that's our responsibility. Why? We cannot have, there is such a war. I'm telling you guys, a war right now because there are changes coming for this Roe versus Wade bill. Was established many years ago, and it can be overturned. If the, if the Christ, if the bride of Christ will rise up and really uh, push against that and rise in power and voice and say, that is killing and that you're killing the, the purposes of God. You're not allowing that to uh, flow into the natural. Let me tell you what our womb, our spiritual womb, our womb is that something is brought from the divine placed in a time period a capsule called the womb for nine months and it comes with purpose it comes ordained it comes with 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 a god of breath and and so that that our we literally our women that give birth are giving birth to miracles are giving birth to the divine plans of god and so we're looking for solutions for medicines for cancer uh for all sorts of things and well that could have come through one of those wombs but you done killed what was in the womb before you were born, Jeremiah, I sanctify you, I ordained you, I appointed you a prophet to the nation. The work of God's spirit in preparing us and equipping us to do the work of the Lord and defeat the devil. May I have some water, please? In spiritual warfare begins before we were ever born. That's why some of you guys have had major warfare to be born. Some of us, as soon as we were born, our parents wanted to sell us or give us away. Some of us wanted to get aborted. And the Lord says, that's not gonna happen because she's mine, he's mine. I've ordained them, I've, I've sanctified them. I've got purpose in their life. And so you have to understand that before you were even born, the war was already raging. And God has marvelous plans for each of us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the thoughts I think toward you. My God, these are the thoughts of our heavenly father to us. These are the thoughts that our Abba, way before we were planted in the womb, he had for us and continues to have for us. For I knew the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. To give you a future and a hope. That's, that's what God wants to give us. But the enemy has not made it easy. And so he's from the way beyond of the womb, he's been already marking us. Again, the point is what God has ordained and chosen you to do, it shall be done. And if you want to come into agreement with that, you say, amen. Point number two, you cannot overthrow what is of God. You can't. Some of us might be like, I don't want this. I, don't want, I didn't ask for this calling. I didn't ask to be, uh, he, uh, you know, uh, uh, right, um, giftings given to me. I didn't ask for any of that. But you can't overthrow what is of God. Again, verse 33, the high priest, going back to the book of Acts, okay? Uh, the high priest and consul, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were furious and they plotted to kill the apostles. And excuse me, this is what the religious spirit does. Its goal is to kill the prophetic moves of God. It wants to kill the prophetic. It is a demon 
that influences and operates in men and women to rage war against what? The grace of God. We've got a lot of dogma, a lot of legalism, and people in bondage, and a lot of people in religion have no liberty because the grace of God is not being taught, is not being, is not being demonstrated. And so this demon wages war against the grace of God in our lives, and it also against the acceptance of Jesus' work as true fulfillment of God's covenant between God and man. So, so that religious spirit wants you to focus on what do I need to do on my own merits versus no, my baby girl, no, my, my dear uh, uh, baby boy, I'll do, do I said my baby boy, right? Okay, no, man of God, no, woman of God. No, you have to understand it's not about what you can do. It's just being willing to accept by faith what Jesus Christ already completed at the cross of Calvary. So the Pharisee, the type, it's a type of religious people who have religion, but no relationship with God. And so this religious spirit will, what, explode and make attempts to kill you when they are confronted and challenged. Well, when we look at verse 33, we see what Peter was telling, because he says, when they heard this, heard what? What the apostle was stating to him. It was you who murdered Jesus by hanging on a tree. Accuse them right there. It was you and the religious spirit is what took Jesus to the cross. So history has proven again and again, man is not going to stop God. Isaac, man can't stop God. If a thing is ordained by God, if it is God's will, nothing is going to stop it. Only the, the person that can stop it is ourselves because we limit God by refusing to submit to it. As followers of Christ, we must be receptive of his will. The high priest gave strict orders to the apostles to never again preach in the name of Jesus. And this seems like a nail in the coffin for Christianity, but nails have never done a good job at holding Christ back. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Howard Marshall once stated, nothing that men can do can stop the progress and ultimate victory of the gospel. So the mission of God will continue to move forward unhindered. And this is regardless of external opposition or internal tension. I know I'm looking at the time and I still got one more point, but I wanna read something from John Calvin. John Calvin in his book, Institutes of the Christian Religion, check this out. Therefore, whenever we hear of Christ as armed with eternal power, let us remember that the perpetuity of the church is secure in this protection. Hence, amid the violent agitation with which it is continuously troubled and amid the grievous and frightful storms that threatens it with unnumbered calamities, it still remains safe. No, this understanding doesn't lead to passivity. Yes, you have a part to play in this. I have a part to play in this. Yes, this means church planting and outreach evangelism matters. Here at Deep Waters Worship Center, we're all about church planting. There is a prophetic word over this church that this will not be the first church planted, but God is taking us international waters to continue planting churches. So we are all about church planting. But wait a minute, we're also about evangelism. We're about getting out to our community and we're about sharing the message of Jesus Christ and we're wrangling in as many as those that will be willing to believe and come in. We're bringing them in. That is also the mission of Deep Waters. We've got to reach out to the lost and bring them so that they could draw to the cross of Jesus Christ. Yes, and yes, and amen. But ultimately, the pressure is not on you. Christ will get his glory one way or another, and he will raise up men and women to achieve his intended purpose. Christianity will never die because Jesus will never die. The church of Jesus Christ will live forever. Nothing will or can stop God's mission. God will get his glory and his purposes will come to pass. He will accomplish what he has ordained. Are you ordained, my brother and sister? Have you got a call from God? Then you're on a commission. Then you have an assignment. Are you attending to it? He will accomplish what he has ordained and all his people, one way or another, will come to him 
and on his timing. We need not to be discouraged, but continue pressing forward in obedience to God and his call. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21 says, there are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel will stand. It is the Lord's counsel that will stand. And I'll finish right here with point number three. May I drink some water, please? Amen. Are y'all being blessed today? Amen. Did you get something today? Yes. Is your faith being stirred up? A man is foolish to fight against God. You're foolish if you think you can fight with God. I tried to fight with God. I lost, I always say I lost almost everything except my truck and ended up living in my mom's basement. <laughs> And then when my health, I, I had some issues with my health and my goodness, I was in a real tight place where either uncle or uh, just kill myself. And I couldn't even be successful in that because God wouldn't allow me to. Because when God has a purpose in you, my dear man of God and woman of God, you can fight and you can run, but he'll get you. He'll get you. He'll get you. You might come back without an eye. You might come out with that, come back to him without a leg. You, what is it going to take before you finally surrender completely wholeheartedly to God? Amen. <laughs> Gamaliel's counsel was do nothing, which was indicative that he was fighting against God. Gamaliel, a man of the law. He was actually the one that taught Paul. Well, Saul. Man of the law, he was uh, a well-known, uh, you could say he was from the Ivy League uh, professors, you know, that taught the law, very well-respected man, but a Pharisee at that, religious. See, because you can know everything about the Bible and not know God. You can, you can quote scriptures, ooh, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You could tell everybody else about, yeah, I know that, yeah, I know that, you know that, but you have no relationship, no intimacy with God. You know nothing. You know nothing. Gamaliel was in that position. He had a title, but he did not know Jesus. And you know what? So Gamaliel's counsel was don't do anything. Let him go. If it's of man's doing, it's going to perish. If it's of God, then we're fighting against God. So he said, uh, so when he said do nothing was indicative that he was actually fighting against God. Why? Because he failed to believe and support God's cause. Your fruits will give you up. You could put up an appearance, but by your fruits, I'll know your tree. Do you support the cause of Christ? Now, I've heard this before and I'm gonna say it because I really believe in it. It's a conviction of mine. If we were to now do an um, audit and check our checkbooks or our bank records, do you support the cause of Christ with your finances? Just saying, because we say we support it, but we don't, we don't give to the supporting of the cause of Christ. Do you support it by your attendance, by your giftings? Some of you are sitting on some powerful giftings, callings. What are you doing with that? Have you done like the evil servant and you only was given one talent and you decided to hide it because you were fearful? And it's going to be taken away from you, given to the others that are multiplying the talent, and you're going to be cast out into utter darkness. We've got to support the cause of Christ. If we believe, that should be reflected in everything that I do, in how I live, in how I make my decisions, and where I go, in my time, in my money. And see, this is where we start nitpicking and start separating. And, and that's where people get uncomfortable. That's where the church starts. You're getting it a little bit extreme, Pastor Chris. No, because that's where the word has to get in and start pulling back the curtains and showing what really is at the root level. God says he has friends and enemies. In what category are you? God has friends and enemies. In what category are you? Because if we are fighting with God and we are opposing God and we are resisting God, then that doesn't sound like a friend to me. And sometimes we could be in enmity with God and we think we're friends and we are the, I am a friend of God, hallelujah. 
I am a friend of God. Really? Let's go to scripture. Let's see what scripture defines a friend. And let me then use that scripture as a standard for me to reflect on and see, am I fulfilling the scripture so that I could say I'm a friend of God? So one of the scariest statements scripture uh, states is found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, while Jesus closed his sermon on the mount. He, he's telling the people, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who what does the what? The will of my father. So we've been ordained. We've been appointed. We've been uh, sanctified. We've been given a job to do. The question is, now are we doing it? Are we doing the will of our father. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We find that uh, at the end of the world, right, Revelation talks about the end times. We see that when Jesus' second coming comes, there's going to be a great war, the enemies of God against Jesus. And we see that's a prophetic image of armies gathering to fight Jesus Christ at his second coming. In the New Testament, there's also a story. And I'm almost done. There's a story of a man who thought he was the friend of God, but only discovered he wasn't. This man was fervently religious. He went to worship services each week, like we come. We come Sunday, we come Monday, we come Wednesday. Ooh, we come to fellowship, we come, you know, yeah. He knew, he knew the Bible from front to back. He can even quote it verbatim. But one day he was confronted by God with the hand, with the hard reality that he was actually an enemy of God. This man is found in the book of Acts chapter nine. His name was Saul of Tarsus. Later, he was known as Apostle Paul. He dedicated his life to fighting against what he considered to be false teaching. But in reality, he was fighting against his creator, Jesus Christ. Could it be possible, possible that we're doing the same thing? Things that we are doing, uh, that we think that they're right, when in reality we're actually opposing and fighting against God? And every Christian can find themselves in a position where they become enemies of God by fighting against the very purpose of God that he established and ordained in our life. The story of Paul uh, is very sobering. He was a very devout man. And by his own description, he was without blame in observing his religious faith. Uh, if such a man could be wrong in how he worshiped God, then how important is it that you and I examine our religion? Are you a friend of God or are you an enemy? So Matthew chapter 7, verse 23 talks about practicing lawlessness. And so we see, consider uh, um, what was already foretold in Revelation that will gather together to make war against Jesus Christ and his return. Uh, who makes up this army? Uh, they are the ones Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me. I, I, I'm giving you some other notes. Don't, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. I'm reading some other notes here. Um, Paul was challenged by God because he was fighting God. Paul was challenged by God because he was literally fighting God. We know Paul's Saul's story. We know he was part of the Pharisee. We know he was taught by Gamaliel. We know that he was coming after the church. He was a persecutor. He was the one that was standing around a circle when uh, um, Esteban was, Stephen was being stoned. And then they brought um, Stephen's clothing and put it at the feet. It was at the feet of Saul. He was the one that would go into the houses and he would pull out um, the, the men, the women, the children, and then they would be murdered. This was the man that was really fighting against God. And so the encounter deeply impacted the rest of his life. From this event, he learned mankind had a fundamental problem. He wrote it about in his letter to Christians in Rome. And that you can find it in Rome chapter 1, verse 28 and 31. Even as they, these of the pagan world, did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to those things which are not fitting. So Paul, he includes a list of behaviors and some that many Christians call big ticket sins. You know, they're fast. Oh, you're in, you're, you're in adultery. Oh, you're in sexual immorality. Oh, you're, you're murder. Wait, wait a minute. Let's, let's talk about some other behaviors too that go because sin is sin, right? And sometimes we look at these big ticket items, but we're failing to see that what's harboring in our hearts. And that's major to God. So when we have uh, deceit, 
um, evil mindedness or backbiting. Uh, pride, we have pride as a problem too. Uh, he talks about boasting and being disobedient to parents. Uh, he warns against not being able to forgive or to show mercy. See, these are major things for God too. So Paul is unsparing in his list. And then he compiles human mistakes that reflect to one degree or another the human problem of not retaining God in our hearts and in our minds on a daily basis. Such behaviors wear down our relationship with God. And these are the types of behaviors that make us then what? Enemies of God. Sin is sin. And it really does take an enormous toll. So to finalize verse 41, we see, we see that after um, Gamaliel says what he says in verse 41, they conclude, apostles departed from their presence, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. Amen. They were not only thrown in prison, then they were flogged. They were flogged for the cause of Christ. Why? To preach. They were before the courts. They were released and they counted it worthy to suffer shame for his name. And this is what they continue to do. This is what a man and a woman of God who understands, who understands that they have been ordained and chosen to do, to do what God has called them to do, it's going to be done. That they understand that what God has called them to do cannot be overthrown because what is of God will remain. That they understand that it is foolish for me to fight against God, so therefore I'm going to submit, I'm going to surrender. And this is what those men and women of God will do. They will daily they're going to go into the temple and they're going to go into every house and they will not cease teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. We will continue men and women of God. We will continue to preach Jesus Christ. We will continue to teach Jesus Christ. We will continue to go out and evangelize. We will continue to do what God has placed in our hearts to do. He has the, been the one that has placed that desire. He gives us the ability to go ahead and empower us to do it. And that work can never be um, thwarted. So what is of God will stand. There's many people, there's many people, let's stand right now. There's many people.